On the 23rd of March 1994, two military aircraft collided while approaching Pope Air Force Base in North Carolina. Both were damaged in the collision. One aircraft was able to land, while the crew of the other were able to safely eject. Among the crew of the two planes, there were no casualties. But the collision would begin a chain of events that would lead to the death of dozens of soldiers, as well as hundreds of injuries. Pope Air Force Base began life as Pope Field in 1919, a small, rudimentary landing field constructed alongside the Army's Camp Bragg base. It was named after First Lieutenant Harley Halbert Pope, who had died in a plane crash early that year. During the first few decades of its operation, it was used to launch many planes and balloons, mostly for observation purposes. During World War II, however, the field expanded rapidly. Its facilities were upgraded with permanent paved runways installed. Over the years of the conflict, tens of thousands of paratroopers trained there to prepare themselves for jumps into various theatres of war. After World War II, Pope Air Force Base remained a vital staging point for moving troops around the world, as well as for continued paratrooper training. Soldiers departed from Pope Air Force Base on numerous military, diplomatic and humanitarian missions around the globe. On the 23rd of March 1994, around 500 paratroopers from three divisions were gathered in the area of the base known as Green Ramp. Officially, the ramp was a relatively featureless aircraft parking area, but in practice the name Green Ramp was used to refer to both this and also an adjacent staging area filled with trees and structures. In this area was a large open-fronted personnel shed, as well as several small training buildings, storage facilities, snack bars, and mock-ups of the rear doors of various planes, designed to allow paratroopers to practice jumps and landings. The majority of the 500 paratroopers were in this staging area, preparing themselves and their equipment for that day's scheduled jumps. In the skies above Pope Air Force Base, two aircraft were approaching. One was an F-16D Fighting Falcon piloted by Captain Joseph Giacino and Scott Salmon. For training purposes, it was conducting a simulated flame-out, or engine failure, landing. The other was a C-130E Hercules piloted by Captain Jose Reyes, Lieutenant Adam Zaret, and Sergeant Joel Myers. It was returning to base having cut short an exercise due to a minor equipment malfunction which affected one of its doors. As the two aircraft approached the base, they collided. The F-16's nose smashed into the C-130's right elevator, causing significant damage to both planes. The crew of the C-130 were able to stabilize their plane and eventually bring it in for a safe landing. The crew of the F-16, however, did not fare so well. Immediately after the collision, Captain Giacino increased the thrust of the F-16, hoping to keep it airborne. At the same time, however, he observed the catastrophic damage to his plane and heard calls to eject over the radio. Assuming, on the basis of these calls, that the damage was more extensive even than what he could see, Captain Giacino ejected, as did the F-16's other pilot. The F-16 was now unmanned, moving at full thrust. It flew on in a huge arc, entirely uncontrolled, eventually impacting with the ground in an empty parking space on green ramp in between two other aircraft. The collision was catastrophic. The F-16 bounced and slid across the ground, smashing into the wing of a parked aircraft. This exploded, creating a massive fireball that, along with the wreckage of the F-16, rolled onward to engulf the staging area where the 500 paratroopers were amassed. Captain Gerald K. Beber, a military chaplain who was present on scene, later recalled the disaster. I recognised the sound from my experience in battle in Desert Storm. As soon as I could think this, a great roaring rush of fire entered my sight above and to the left of the pack shed. It was at treetop level, slanting down as it gushed into the mock-up area at terrific speed. The flame came through the tops of the trees that stood in a small open area beside the pack shed. In the torrent of flame, I saw pieces of wreckage and machinery hurling along. As the torrent rushed in, I could hear cries of alarm, curses, and someone yelling, run, from the mock-ups. The fire blast crackled as it blasted in, and at its sides it curled outward as it went forward. 
I was standing perhaps 30 feet beside the edge of the blast and could see eddies of the flame curling out toward me. I turned and ran from the flame to just beyond the right end of the pack shed where I no longer felt the intense heat, so I stopped. To my left, out on the aircraft ramp, now in my line of sight, I could see a parked C-141 engulfed in flames. The injuries caused by the crash were severe. Many paratroopers were burned or suffered traumatic injuries from flying debris. Worse still, the crash sprayed aviation fuel over a wide area. Many soldiers had their uniforms contaminated with fuel, but did not realize this until they attempted to extinguish nearby flames and caught fire themselves. Several more were also injured when the heat of the flames set off live ammunition from the damaged aircraft. Despite the imminently dangerous conditions of the accident site, surviving soldiers on scene quickly began to help their injured comrades, putting out fires, tending to wounds, and beginning a massive operation to transport the injured to the nearby Womack Army Medical Center. Some of the more seriously injured were evacuated by helicopter to other specialist medical facilities. The response to the crash was, for a number of reasons, extremely swift and well-coordinated. The paratroopers involved had conducted countless drills and training exercises to prepare for mass casualty events like this. Likewise, the Womack Army Medical Center was able to use mass casualty emergency plans that staff had formulated and practiced many times before. Patients were triaged in the driveway, allowing the most seriously injured to be prioritized. Air Force firefighters were able to work seamlessly with civilian firefighters, as the two groups had previously coordinated to ensure that they had compatible equipment and protocols. The flames from the explosion were extinguished within hours, and the damaged aircraft were made safe. Though it had been a devastating accident with many serious injuries, all of the injured were transported to further medical care within 45 minutes of the crash. In total, 23 people had been killed and more than 100 injured. One further seriously burned paratrooper would pass away in hospital as a result of his injuries more than nine months later. An investigation by the army concluded that numerous errors had coincided to cause the accident and that most of these errors had been made by the air traffic controllers working at Pope Air Force Base. On the day of the accident, a trainee air traffic controller was on duty, supervised by a more experienced controller. Control of the F-16 was handed to him without prior warning by a civilian air traffic controller at nearby Fayetteville. This handover should have been coordinated by phone call, but was not. Despite this, the trainee noted the potential for conflict between the F-16 and the C-130 and attempted repeatedly to direct the C-130 away from this potential danger. However, as he did so, he accidentally used the wrong call sign, and his efforts were thus unsuccessful. At this point, his supervisor stepped in and took over control of the situation, but failed to deconflict the two aircraft in time. The confusing situation had also been exacerbated by the incorrect placement of a flight data strip and a radar display that had not been updated with the correct information. As a result of this investigation, two officers were reassigned to other duties and a further three were subject to disciplinary action. A memorial service was held for the deceased on the 29th of March 1994. In addition to this, the then President of the United States, Bill Clinton, visited the crash site and spoke to paratroopers recovering in hospital. He later said, I wish everyone in America could see the faces and the eyes and the spirit of these people. They would realize how fortunate we are to be served by men and women like them. <laughs>